Hi guys, welcome back to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. I am so excited to be interviewing the gorgeous and talented Natasha Denman. Now, Natasha is a highly sought after professional speaker, CSP accredited, a coach and a mentor. Natasha is a 12 time published author and creator of the game changing business model, Ultimate 48 Hour Author. She's developed over 500 solo entrepreneurs. I can't even get that out. Preneurs. And because uh, become first time published author in 15 different countries around the world, including Australia, USA, UAE, and Canada. Two years ago, Natasha has also founded her own publishing company, Ultimate World Publishing, and her authors are now writing their second book and third books. That's amazing. Appearing in all major media outlets across Australia, including the Sydney Morning Herald, the Financial Review, and The Age, Natasha is changing the way people do business in Australia and the world. She now runs a multiple seven-figure business with her husband and three children, traveling the world, spreading her message, and helping small businesses thrive. Welcome, Natasha Denman. Thank you, JJ. It's really great to be What an introduction. Yeah, I know. It's always funny that when it gets read out, you go, really? Have I really done all of that? <laughs> and there's more because I was reading your LinkedIn. Today, oh, yeah. yeah. And I was just thinking there's so much more from, from you know, building, of course, your seven plus figure business. In, mm -hmm. And you've had your business for 10, 10 years, haven't you? 10 years this year, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I said, publishing 12 books, nominated for Telstra Business Woman of the Year twice. Mm, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, and a finalist of Oz. Mom, now I'm trying to say that word. Again. Mompreneur. Mom, mompreneur. <laughs> I'm a speaker coach, everyone. So you know, I, I cannot uh, pronounce words. You have launched your own publishing company, and the list goes on. And you're a mom with three kids. Yeah, uh, I think that's phenomenal, and you know, an inspiration to so many people out there. I, I want to start with where did you? Like, where did you come from? I know you started in coaching. Did you start in coaching 10 years ago? Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, That's, well, I deem my taking the course as the start of my business because as soon yeah. as we came out of that first training, they said, go and find clients. You're a business owner now and all that sort of stuff. So that's when I say I officially started my business, even though like we just finished the training and just went out there and looked for clients. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And your first year was challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Tell me about that. Like two or three paying clients and only $7,000 in revenue yet invested over $45,000 in mentors, programs, uh, coaches for myself, like just really invested in my education and development to figure out how to get this thing off the ground. <laughs> yeah. And, and when did, so in that whole year, like what was your, you know, what was your strategy in that year? The first year that you went out? Mainly they told us the way you find clients is get out there and network and yeah. go to two networking events a week. And as you go to places, look to become a member of a couple of groups where you can consistently turn up. And I didn't realize how big this would be, um, you know, uh, for what I didn't, what happened in the second year. But by just sticking to two events every week, I attended over 104 events, okay? Which meant in Melbourne or within my 15 kilometer radius, I, wherever I walked in, people would know me and I would know them. So yeah. when my first book came out at month 13, the reason that gave me the success in the six figure business in the next 12 months was because I had established no like and trust with a lot of people. Yeah. And therefore, you know, the opportunities came because then the book gave me that extra credibility. Yeah. Awesome. What, what prompted you to get into coaching? What was your, you know, what was your driving force? You mean, what was my shit hits the fan moment? Yeah, that's it. yeah, yeah. yeah. I was <laughs> I was trying to be eloquent with it, but yeah, yeah. when did you hit the fan moment? <laughs> well, yeah, because I've found out nine out of 10 coaches go into coaching because there was some shit hits the fan moment mm. that they need to actually, first of all, work on themselves before they could help other people. Yeah. And for us, it was my husband losing a, a third share franchise. He used to have a Specsavers franchise in yeah. Epping, Victoria. 
and we used to come from the optical industry. So our life before being um, in this field was in optics, so PSM and Specsavers. And he lost that business by making a poor decision in March 2010, which was just over 10 years ago. And that's when I was like, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, my whole world fell apart. We had two mortgages. I was only working three days a week. I had my first child who was 18 months old at the time. And I was just like, my back's up against the wall. And I thought, you know, coaching the advertising said six figures income, part-time hours. And I go, this is my solution. You know, yeah. little did I know all the stuff that I had to go through to get to, you know, that, that dream, you know, that, yeah. that they sell, which is, which is fine. Otherwise no one would do it if they told you what actually you had to do to build a yeah. business. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's why um, Stuart lost the, the business and he was just like, and I thought he was all about building a business, but first of all, I needed to sort my own self out before I could help other people. Yeah, absolutely. And what was the, what was the, then the turning point? So there were six, 12 months worth of say $7,000 worth of sales. Yeah. And I don't know how you were feeling at the end of that year, because you know, all the events you were going to, you know, what was that turning point when you started to think, shit, this is, I think things are changing right now. Well, it was the decision to write the first book, which was made yeah. at seven months in when I only had one paying client, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of people go, oh, I need to get more clients. I need to know more to write a book and all this sort of stuff. No, because you've got your life, your experiences, yourself, you know, you can share. Mm -hmm. And so writing that book and then that book came out at month 13. And so when the book came out and I received it in my hands, like I grew three inches taller, I reckon. <laughs> Like I saw my face in the book and I was like, oh my God, that's me. I'm so proud of myself. Not many people <laughs> do this. And it's as if now when I went out networking, I would introduce myself as the ultimate weight loss coach, which was my initial niche yeah. uh, of helping people lose the last 10 kilos. All of a sudden, it was just like people who knew, liked me and trusted me from all this networking I did started offering me those speaking opportunities to speak in front of them. Um, in a chiropractic clinic, they would invite me and speak after hours when they, they would finish for the day to yeah. their patients, a group of patients of seven or eight. And then um, personal training studio owners would get me to come into their gyms and kind of do a talk also for 45 minutes and I would have my book there. And from there, people wanted to experience the coaching behind that talk. And that's where I filled up my practice solid one-to-one. Uh, -one. And that is when the business grew to those first six figures and I knew that I would never have to return to a day job again. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, I mean, you know, I, I can imagine it wasn't just the first six months, then suddenly it goes to six figures. Like what, what other key decisions have, have you made to yep. get your business from seven, K, well, from zero to seven K then to, you know, seven figures had, what were some really key moments for you? So then um, when the book first book came out, I also rebranded. My old brand was called PRS Coaching, which absolutely stood for nothing. Um, so the rebranding to Ultimate Weight Loss Lose the Last 10 Kilos, where I became really specific in a niche that was a really broad niche because yeah. weight loss is a big highway. So what's your lane in it, I say? And for me, it was Lose the Last 10 Kilos. So working out how to be very specific and not everything to everyone was really key along the whole way of the journey. And then as we're going through the years, it was all about noticing what do other people see in me that they want for themselves and creating the programs and the solutions behind that. Because all of a sudden, after the weight loss, I started to slowly attract people who wanted product development. Like, how did you write this book? I created some programs and they're like going, teach us how to do this for our business. And I'm like, I think I'm business coaching, but I wasn't really business coaching. It was all about create products for profit, which was the niche within business coaching because business coaching is a big highway. So what's your lane in it? Yeah. And so, um, and so then that evolved obviously and got the business to multiple six figures. And then of course, deciding to help people write a book in 48 hours after I had done it for myself, because I didn't invent this out of thin air, decided this is how it's going to happen. I actually did it for one of the co-authored books. So I wrote a book with one other person and by us doing it in three hours, half a book each on a weekend, <laughs> I thought, well, if we can, I can write half a book on a weekend in three hours. I'm sure I could show people how to do the whole book 
in the 48 hours and I can teach the marketing and all the other stuff but that goes around books. And so that's when we launched the first um, retreat. And it didn't get to, so the other key decision, I guess, five years ago was to invest in Facebook ads because you exhaust your warm network at some point. You cannot scale massively if you're just going to rely on warm relationships. And by me uh, tapping into Facebook ads, now I'm able to run my business internationally because people find out about me through my paid advertising. And that's how we end up connecting and working together. Yeah, love it. And what, what's been your biggest challenges that you've had over the 10 years? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, obviously, initially, it was about what's my niche? Um, how am I any different from other people? Um, you know, because there's so many coaches out there, right? Everyone seems to be a coach. We walk into a networking event, there's 15 coaches there, right? Introducing themselves in a very similar way, yeah? And so um, that was one of my first things, you know, as I exhausted my warm network, it was like, how do I keep finding people who've never heard from me from a bar of soap? And that was then obviously overcome by mastering and getting better at Facebook ads and having a really well-oiled machine with the business. And of course, the other challenges were like personal stuff, right? You know, uh, taking care of yourself, your health, uh, juggling the three kids, the two other, the two other kids, the two, two extra kids after the first one came right in the middle of the business taking off. Like, you know, there was no stop for maternity leave. There was no such thing, uh, you know, when you have your own business. So you just kind of like have the baby on the boob and you just do your emails and do all that kind of stuff because I, I had a goal to breastfeed all three children until they were one. Yeah. And I that and the third one came on flights and interstate and all that sort of stuff but um yeah look it's been worth it because i would say the first three years were the hardest like and really intense and you scary and all that kind of stuff but then my husband joined the business two and a half years in i think yeah. and then he quit his day job so then we we're on our own and then i would say for a year and a half or two i was like oh my god you know he has to go through his own journey of you know, becoming a business owner versus an employee, that whole mindset shift you've got to have. And then after, I reckon the last five years though, we really have um, lived life by choice. We've traveled so much. And having this year off actually has been a bit of a break from a decade of so much intense travel for business and pleasure that um, COVID actually pushed us to pivot fully online now. And and we have a new business model that is thriving and has doubled in the during COVID. Yeah, fantastic. What what's been your biggest mistake in business? Ooh, sometimes I wait a bit long to do um, certain things um, because I'm not too big a risk taker. I am. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. Yeah. But sometimes, like a hiring a, a virtual assistant, for example. Like I waited, I think, two and a half years, three years too long. <laughs> you know, I should have done it sooner so I could, you know, I guess give myself more of the time that I needed to co continue to develop the business. So some of those things, you know, maybe I wait a bit too long. I'm a bit cautious around, you know, bringing extra expenses into the business without knowing that I can 100% cover them off. But I, I don't regret for a moment doing anything um, that I have done in the last 10 years. I, I actually sat down when I was my 10 year anniversary about a few months ago and I did a, a few lives around that. And one of the ones, if I could go back, what are the five things I would change? Uh, don't ask me off the top of my head right now what they are, but I know the VA stuff, the virtual assistant stuff was uh, one of them. And there was like four others that I talked about, but it was really hard to come up with them. I really struggled to come up with what I would change if I had to do it all over again. Yeah. Um, because I think I've, I've made some great decisions and um, yes, there's been hard moments, but I'm always very solution focused. I always know that I can fix anything. Yeah. I love it. How do you think you've grown? Like if you, if you think about you as a person 10 years ago, because uh, mm -hmm. I often say that the decisions that I made, and this is my second business, my first business, uh, I decided to, to not do it anymore because of the uncertainty. And, and I left when, when it was thriving, Nat, like <laughs> crazy stuff. But because of the uncertainty, I left my business, the first yeah. one. Uh, and I know that the decisions that I make, the person I am today is so different 
to the person I was when I first had my first business. Completely different. Uh, how have you changed from when you first started business? Like the confidence and the certainty that I can handle anything, you know, not being scared to invest and, um, you know, really back myself to learn from other people. Um, just, I mean, yeah, you can't, you can't compare it. Business is your biggest personal development journey you're going to ever uh, go on, you know, and it can be so scary at times and so elating at others. And you learn how to ride that roller coaster and know that behind every tough time, there'll be good times and vice versa behind every good time. There will be certainly some shitty, uh, shitty moments when, um, when you need to like really, you know, use your mindset. So developing my mindset and being more resourceful along the way has been um, something that I have so many tools under my belt now. And the reason we've been so happy during this whole lockdown situation and COVID is because of all of those tools that I cried quite all over the years. It's like, it's not like I have no choice. I've got choice to do something different with my time and the space that I can be in right now. So let's just do that and do it, you know, be, be better. So um, yeah, the resourcefulness, problem solving, confidence. I mean, people look at me and they go, I just can't be like, you know, you're so confident. So did you see me like a decade ago? Like I was <laughs> the same place where you are right now, walking into networking events with sweaty hands and quivery voice and not knowing how to like felt like I'm, you know, complete outsider who that didn't belong there and all that sort of stuff. When I did my first events and speaking gigs, you know, they were in front of three or five people or once in front of one person, like you weren't there at those times. And this is what I say, you want to have what I have, but are you willing to go through everything that I've experienced and, um, and been through? And some of those things, you know, you just walk away and you have no results or you yeah. put in so much effort and you're just like so disappointed after, but it's part of growing and collecting mm -hmm. those experiences, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, I often talk to my clients and I say, you've got to be a dog with a bone. Mm. you've got to be a dog with a bone with your business because it's just you know and sometimes I see people say oh you know I've, I've tried everything you know I tried I tried doing a Facebook live once and no one or I did a not live event and no one came and so I'm not doing it again it's like really like <laughs> you've got to do things over and if that doesn't work I've try something 20 times if not more yeah I mean, get good at either doing lives or or um webinars or seminars or God, you got to try so many times the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And and with your because your your hubby's in the business now. How long has he been? Two and a half years, did you say? Oh no, he was. He's coming up to eight years this Christmas. Eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, how do you how do you integrate business mm. and your personal life? You got the three kids. You're working with Stuart, your hubby in business. You know, how did you, how, how do you continue to integrate it and how did you initially integrate? Were there challenges with that? Yeah, initially they were because obviously he wasn't part of uh, the growth that I was experiencing in personal development and mm -hmm. he was still going to his day job and he had his, he had made the mistake that he did that caused the shit hit the fan in the moment. So he had to get through that and, um, and be able to be, I guess, live with himself, right? Yeah. Um, and so for two and a half years, there was a little bit of a diversion because I was starting to speak differently and obviously read all these books and go to all these seminars and he wasn't having the same experiences, right? Yeah. But uh, he did see the positive shifts and changes that I was feeling and how I was coming across, you know, in a, on a level and started to read a couple of my books and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and I think he just spent some time self-studying not so much going to seminars you know we've been to a few together but not not a lot and um he gets it he's very smart i think he's a very intuitive person around that kind of stuff he like really he'll pick stuff up much faster than anyone like i always say, say he's got more talent but i i i'm like a dog with a bone <laughs> like I, don't, I might not have the talent but i'll just go and do it do it do it do it and get better whereas i think he has to do something once or twice and he just really really gets it but that's I guess in success, it's not just the only thing that you need. You you need to be like a dog with a bone, and yeah. so um, and so then we started to converge back again once we had that common understanding about human behavior and you know egos and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we have a lot of fun because our 
previous career was both in the same industry as well. So we both worked for OPSM. We both worked for Specsavers. So we've always had the same jobs and roles, right? So yeah. it wasn't uncommon for us to talk work or business at home. Um, and neither it is. It just, it doesn't even feel like we're running a business. It feels this is our life. Yeah. Like this is what we just happen to do. And, and that's why I think often people, you know, you, you read about all of these achievements and I'm like kind of going, I'm just doing what I find fun. And I just happen to get paid for it along the way. And it doesn't feel like really work. So yeah. when I have conversations with him, it's about planning, not just our um, business, like we planned the 2021 calendar on Friday and we're just thinking, well, what are all the other things that are going to fit around the holidays and all that kind of stuff. So we just kind of, everything blends in. I don't think there's a, too much of a, this like, you know, now it's low, now it's business. So yeah. it just blends. Yeah. I love that. With um, thinking about your, you know, what do you think when you look at successful people, what do you think the key abilities that you need to have or skills to be successful in business well yeah you need to be that dog with the bone <laughs> i love that metaphor i'm like <laughs> i never thought about it all i could is uh, I'll picture my mum's puppy ruby who do, does that thing <laughs> yeah, don't, you're not getting that bone i'm gonna keep hold of that bone <laughs> yeah oh gosh um uh yeah a willingness to um learn from those that have the results you want yeah. Okay, so so much has to do. Don't listen to those that don't have results and they're trying to give you advice. Oh my god, I get I see so many people like um listen to their cousins or friends or whoever who are just employees, they have no idea. Or yeah. maybe I'm helping someone write their book and they're listening to someone who's not an author, never written a book, da -da -da -da, and they're getting like discouraged. Yeah. So please, please, whatever you do, um only model those and listen to those who have got the results you want in your life and certainly be willing to pay for their time and advice because it's not just about paying them. It's actually half of your transformation will occur because you have skin in the game. Yes. So if you pay someone 20 grand, you know, you've got skin in the game. It's going to hurt you if you don't do the work. Yeah. But then of course you're working with someone um, and you respect their time and their, the time they've spent to develop whatever it is that they're teaching you, whatever system. And therefore, you know, then you walk away with a system. Like um, initially I used to invest in mentors that were more gener generic, if you like, like, um, yeah. like GPs. Now I invest in specialists, you know, whether it's my Facebook ads person who I pay a monthly retainer to really manage that side of things. Uh, whether I, I want to just learn publicity or I want to learn about like a specific, like how to create an ever be, evergreen webinar that would uh, convert into sales conversations or whatever it is. So now I, um, my uh, mentoring and support will used to be generalized. Now it's very specific in, in terms of what problem do I, or what gap do I want to fill in my business and how do I learn how to do that? And I'll buy a program or a structure or a system and work with a person who's doing that successfully. Yeah. Fantastic. And you know, one of the things that I see that you're really great at is building that tribe mm. and how you can do And you're on social media a lot mm. and you're also repurposing stuff a lot. So if you're doing an event, you've got the video there. I'm here doing an event. I've just set up my event. So I'm going to take a photo or I'm going to take a video. Uh, what would be your tips around that? Yeah. So it might seem like there's a lot out there, but it's everything's more. Yeah. Just yeah. um, this morning, for example, I did my Monday morning lives that I do every Monday morning on my personal profile and I've been doing them for the last five years. Now that Monday morning live turns into uh, my virtual assistant will scrape it off Facebook, will upload it on my YouTube channel. She will take out the audio, she'll put it up as a podcast. She will then, um, well, I send some of them to my, um, this is another thing I've invested in lately, email marketing team who writes my emails for my database. Now they pull the content of my videos. I don't need to type, sit them and type them. They listen to them, they transcribe them, they create awesome engaging emails that guide twice to our database, just value, pure value emails, value ads. And so all of a sudden, my one half an hour on a Monday morning becomes a lifelong content piece that's spread in so many different spots. Yet it feels like it's been posted everywhere and done everything, you know, done the rounds, everything that I film. 
you know, everything that I sort of train on, like the masterclass you presented at um, a week or so ago, uh, you know, that was filmed and now it's available for the authors who missed it. Uh, you know, we may have had 60 people live there, but there's 500 people in our high-end community that are going to access probably that at some stage. And then later on, I can package them and sell those recordings in the future, right? Yeah. So it's really just about just thinking smart and leveraged um, and knowing that you don't have to do a ton of stuff, but you just got to be ready for it. How, it's, how is it going to be leveraged and multiplied and spread in those different, you know, through those different avenues. Yeah. And with your, you talked about this before in regards to having, I often talk about, and I know you, you, you're a Tony Robbins fan as well, in regards to Tony Robbins saying, you know, 80% of your psychology is a, for you to achieve anything, any goals is your psychology. And so how do you keep as a leader in the industry, how do you keep your psychology and your health, your, your body and your health, uh, really, you know, in peak form. Yeah, routines, right? You've got so, abs, girl. I saw, I saw a post with your abs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've got a PT. So I only do. I say to people, I do one hour and fourteen minutes exercise a week. Now, why is it that specific? That's specific. <laughs> I do two full-on thirty-minute PT sessions with my personal trainer Monday and Thursday. And I followed a seven minute workout app that's on my phone. And I do that twice a week. So that's two times seven minutes, it's 14 minutes. <laughs> and then um, I do my obviously two times 30 minutes, that's an hour. So one hour and 14 minutes. So that's all the exercise that I do, right? Um, and that keeps me fit, healthy, um, well toned, all that kind of stuff. Um, lately, the last two years, I've been doing this awesome 23 day detox um, program once every six months, which is amazing uh, for just feeling amazing. Like you, you can lose six or seven kilos doing it. Like, you know, it's, some people do it for that regard, but I do it for how it makes me feel and the energy that it gives me and how it just kind of feels like my body is lighter at the end of it all. Yeah. And so we do that at the start of the year and sort of just coming out of winter. And my husband, you know, he struggles a little bit more with his weight. So for him, like, it's like kind of got other benefits as well. But um, we both feel amazing. Like, it feels like you're on speed or something. <laughs> like, it's just that kind of energy you get. Um, now that I'm home and I'm not getting on and off flights uh, as much, I'm able to eat normal as well. Not yeah. being like, you know, hotel rooms and eating to re restaurants. I'm so happy, like, just to have a routine uh, in eating. So every, I'm very, I'm very, uh, I have so many, like we walk away from an employee job looking for this flexible lifestyle. But I think human beings thrive on routines and yeah. working normal hours and having their lunch at the same time. I think we revert back to the nine to five anyway. And that's where we feel like, you know, have our weekends off, have all of that, you know, you know, I think it's come full circle where I prefer to just have a normal working week and I know when the weekend is and I know, you know, I'm going to shut down two weeks over Christmas or whatever. So, um, yeah, I thrive on that and pre-planning 12 to 18 months ahead of time. I know what's happening, always scheduling all my holidays because we take about four months off a year with our kids. Uh, well, when we can travel, that's how much we travel, um, you know, all, all school holidays. So we make sure that... This is, you know, we're working to live, not just living to work. Um, and this year, it's just been, yes, a lot of work because there hasn't been travel. However, that's been kind of beneficial because we've now purchased a property in Queensland, which is going to become our second home. And we're going to be able to run the business from there and run some private retreats. And so we've been able to reinvest and build something for our life, even amongst these circumstances. Yeah. With your with your mindset what what do you uh what are your habits that you have in regards to keeping your mindset strong yeah so i don't meditate a ton um like um i've i've done it but it's just too passive for me <laughs> same same yeah so um sometimes i put it on and while i'm laying i i do lately have liked to use the foam rollers and um, they say spinal flossing where you lay down on it and you really stretch out because sitting on computers obviously now for the whole day is 
rather than being moving a lot. You know, that's been one exercise that I've added on. It's not, it's not really an exercise because all you're doing is laying there, <laughs> not, you know, stretching, which is great. Um, but sometimes I'll put on the meditation thing on while I'm laying down there, or I'll just do it while I'm watching a show or someone with the kids. Um, but I, um, I've started diamond painting. Ooh. Diamond painting is like, you know, um, you get little diamantes and it's like by numbers and the different yes. colors and all that. And it's very meditative. Like it's like, it's just so I come up with the best ideas doing it. I literally will set up my dining table on a Friday and I'll leave it there till the sun and I'll just go to it every like every now and again I'll just sit and do an hour or something and I come up with my best ideas and that's kind of I found this is my meditation um and then you end up with amazing pictures you can hang up in your house or you can give us gifts and stuff for people because they look really really nice so that's what I do and I'm I do have my gratitude and affirmations that I just ramble off in my head. I don't read them off anything. I just know yeah. what I need to do. So I just do it as I fall asleep at night or as I wake up in the morning. I do my visualization. Like tomorrow, I've got my seminar tomorrow, my promotional one. And I've got over 50 people coming. So I just, before, I, when I wake up in the morning, I'm just going to visualize everyone having a good time and laughing and smiling and me being in my zone. Like when I feel like when I'm delivering just, with full energy and passion, which I always do, but I know sometimes when I feel like, oh, you know, I'm struggling <laughs> and other times I'm like, just so like, just can't stop me. Like people go, what the hell did she take to the <laughs> <laughs> My husband can take, tell the difference between the, um, you know, when I'm really on. Yeah. Um, and I'll just Im imagine those kind of things. And then if shit hits the fan or crappy moments occur, which they do, I asked myself some really good quality questions. And these are the ones I've picked up from a Tony Robbins book that I've chosen to memorize. And that is the three questions is like, how can I use this? What's funny about this? What will I think about this in five to 10 years time? Yes. And I always like, if it's something really crappy has happened, just go up, ramble off one question, answer it for myself, do the next one, answer it for myself. And I just do it all in my head. And then I start to feel better at the other end and then try to get into some action to see how I can sort something out and move beyond <laughs> that moment because that's when our mindset is necessary. It's not necessary when we're on top of the world and we're super feeling successful and, um, you know, everything's going our way. We need our mindset when it's crappy and you get that crappy email from a client, or, you know, some problems occurred or, yeah. or someone's, you know, just, yeah, it's, it's when shitty happens things happen yeah. you need your mindset tools. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. with with mentors what mm. what are the mentor you know what mentors have you had that have really helped you progress in your business and in your life they've all had obviously yeah. a, a role you know to play um i had my first mentor peter he was my mentor for two and a half years and he he saw me go from nothing to six figures um, and beyond. Then I had a mentor called Melissa and she was only with us for about five months, but she's the one that helped me develop and think about building a community and a tribe, as you said, yeah. and encouraged me to start my first Facebook group, which grew to 15,000 members and still around. Then, then I had me here. Unfortunately, me here passed away about a year ago and he was my age, which was really sad, but I had him. He was the one that um, took me from the multiple six figures to seven and he did a lot of change work, you know, like deep work, you know, I don't even know what he was doing. I was paying him a ton of money, but whatever you're doing, it's working. I chose to believe, <laughs> you know, it was a bit of woo woo kind of mentoring. Yeah. And then, um, and then I've had this, uh, the specific people like the publicity person and the person who taught me the Evergreen webinar, my Facebook ads, people that I've had multiple two or three people over the years that I've admired and I, you know, I know they get results. So, I'm willing to invest, you know, some of those people think I've been crazy for investing certain amounts for people per month or whatever, but I always know I have the confidence in myself that I'm going to do the work. That's the yeah. one thing I'm sure of. Um, the one thing people always go when they doubt in investing, they go, oh, but will this work for me? Like, you know, um, yeah. and I said, I think that's the wrong question to yeah. ask. Uh, the question you always need to ask, are you willing to do the work? 
Yes. Because everything's going to work with you. Sometimes people ask us, oh, what's my, it would be my return investment of working with, you know, is this program going to work for me and all that? And my husband's got a funny station. We, go, we guarantee our system works and people have had amazing, tremendous success with it. But what we can't guarantee is that you, you do. Yeah. <laughs> so the system works, but we don't know if you do, um, because we know the reality is some people just don't have the, the, the drive or the stamina or the staying power to move past the challenging initial steps that is required to reach a certain level of success. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I know with your book, did you see your book here? I, I had it strategically placed just for you. <laughs> and uh, I did see that, that you're talking about. I, ha I, I had this highlighted in regards to what you were just saying. And you, yeah, it's highlighted here. I'm not making it up. And it what says, am I willing to do the work? Oh, there you go. I'm willing to do the work. And that's exactly right. And, and I think... Uh, for me, I know with my first business, the, for me to invest in that business, I was such a scumbag, Nat. I was such a scumbag with everything. Like, I'll try and do everything myself mm -hmm. because it was like even, you know, my branding, everything was all about holding on to money as mm -hmm. if it was, you know, I, I, I wouldn't think of even a return on investment. I was thinking of it as a cost, as if I was paying out like a fine or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so to be able to say, hold on a minute, it's up to me to make it work and for me to do the work and then look at your return on what return on investment do I, can I create myself from doing this with this person? So oh. if I wanted to, to, you know, get my book written mm. and published, then it's about, okay, well, I need to make this happen. I need to make it work. And what will I create from a dollar perspective back yeah. Uh, because I'm doing this. Yeah. 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 And following everything you get given, you know, you know, it's not just about writing a book. You know, we provide our authors so many resources and trainings, like, you know, the one you were part of speak for profit, like every yeah. author should be speaking on their topic and imagine how many, how much revenue they can generate from speaking and what they would offer for, at a speaking gig at the end of it. So that could mean like from one speaking gig, you can get your return on investment, depending on what you, if you've catered, um, something amazing for people to take action on next. Yeah? yeah. So yeah, the big, big difference in my life, I've stopped using the word cost. You know, yeah. even when you walk into a clothing store, yeah. I don't like to um, ask how much is this? What's the, you know, how much does it cost? <laughs> like I almost like, you know, I, I don't say that would sound really silly. Well, you know, what's the investment in this? <laughs> you know? But I really avoid, I almost, um, you know, I just don't even ask the questions. I just kind of will find out for myself or what would I invest in this? What is it worth, worth to me? You know, because everyone's got a different uh, gauge of what's valuable to them. Like yeah. before we were outside with, a, with my husband and we actually have to get um, some people to come cut some trees that go across our fence from the neighbours um, and I, I was putting a job on Airtasker, which is where people can kind of bid for your business, but you have kind of need to offer what you're willing to pay. Right. Yeah. And I said to my husband, what, what should I put the price to be like for someone to come and do this, like cutting of the, you know, trimming back and one stump removal and all that. He goes, oh, I wouldn't even know. And I said, well, what would you, what, what do you think this is worth? I said, what is it worth to us? What are you willing? Are you willing to pay 500, a thousand dollars? What is it, you know, yeah. um, because we put that and someone can say no to that. Um, you know, like um, it's, it's really interesting how people have very um, limiting beliefs around what asking for what they want or what they think they're worth. Yeah. yeah? yeah. I mean, you know, um, my mum was saying to me the other day, oh, you should pay um, your clean um, X amount for doing the windows, the extra work. I asked her for, to do some extra work. I said, I'll pay her what she wants to be paid. I said, I always say, what, 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 what would you like to, you know, what, how much extra would you like to receive for the extra work you've done? And they named their price. I don't know if you heard that story that Tony Robbins shares about him um, meeting, like, I don't know, coming up to a homeless person and the homeless person asking for $5. Can I please have $5? And Tony Robbins just giving him $5, you know? Yeah. Um, and he said, if he had asked me for a thousand, I would have given him a thousand as well. Yeah. 
but he just yeah. asked for five. So I just did, gave him what he asked for. Yeah. So I always think about that. And I said to my mom, I'm just going to give her what she asks for because she's the one that has to determine if this, what this job is worth and what she's worth. And that's, that's what I'm going to give her. I'll give her a little bit extra because I'll be grateful for what she's done. Yeah. But um, yeah, I always, I always think about that and I never am scared in uh, all, for what I do. And our program is one of the highest price programs in this country for what the type of what it is. And sometimes people go, oh, she's so expensive. And I said, well, I don't look at being the most expensive. I look at who gives the greatest value. Yeah. You know? And how, and value is not the calculated price. Value is about the experience and what people feel and how they, you know, how they are when they actually work with you. And when people come, they said, I think you're too cheap. My clients actually tell me for what you give us now, you just don't stop giving. Yeah. And they say, I think you're on the price. That's what they tell me once they're in my system. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. And I think, you know, with, with, and I'm going to ask you a little bit about how, what that, that looks like getting into your system and, and becoming a 48 hour author, but the value of having a book is like, I, I know we have a lot of clients that, that uh, we share <laughs> from a speaking point of view and, and going over to you and, and getting their books written and, and published. And and I work with people that have worked with you and they've got their book and it's like, wow, you've got this book. You then go on a speaker's platform. You then can then uh, sometimes create an online program with your book as well. There's so many different avenues and from a promotional PR perspective, having a book. Uh, but, but it's even more than that. It's the, as you said at the start, when you said, when I first got my book, it was like, oh, my face is on it. <laughs> I think there's this transformation of confidence with being able to create your own book. Uh, and I know from a speaking point of view, it's almost like they've given their voice, they're, they're being seen, they're allowing themselves to be seen now yeah. because it's quite a personal journey, isn't it? Writing your own book. It's a transformation. I always say writing your first book is actually not about the book, but about the person you become at the other end of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it's the thing, that's the thing that's going to transform first. And that new sense of newfound sense of confidence and certainty in yourself is the thing that's going to start to generate at that frequency, the opportunities, whether it's speaking opportunities or clients that, you know, you only would have dreamt of working with prior to, um, you know, being an author. And that's the stuff that I always say, you just wait. It's sometimes it may not be the, the business thing that you get out of the book, it might something might be something completely different. And I do have a certain percentage of my authors that purely write their book for a healing journey. Yeah. But certainly the ones that really want to follow the pathway that I have with speaking and events and, you know, working with high end clients and programs, they want to follow what I have done. And, and we definitely see that if they do the work and they follow the advice and they attend their master classes after they've done their book, you know, to learn more in depth, the strategies behind doing it all, then that's all available. A six, seven figure business is available to all of them. Yeah. With what's the, tell me about in a nutshell, what the program is. So when someone says, yeah, I want to go on to your 48 hour retreat. What does it look like? What do they go through? Yeah. So we, um, it's an end to end. So there's nothing else they need to look out for when they do our program because everyone, everything's in house, you know, from, from the haven't put pen to paper yet uh, to unpacking their book, making it sexy and marketable, you know, getting the prep for their 48 hour author retreat to coming the, to the retreat, being part of a group, which is very encouraging and supportive. Uh, then having the publishing all ready to go and um, handing it over through editing layout, the printing stages. And of course, beyond that, attending their additional trainings to leverage that book. Yeah. So it really is all inclusive and a lot of our relationships with our clients are very long term. Like, you know, I see people, well, I've had my secret authors group for over seven years now and there's still the people from a retreat one are still there, you know, and come back to some of their trainings, even some, sometimes because in some aspects we, for some of our packages, we give lifetime access to some of the, the support. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, my husband's involved more at the front end where he helps them preps them. 
Yes. Then I'm the main trainer and obviously, um, you know, and I oversee and I've created the system and I know everything and I've got to manage all of my people. And then I've got my publications people, which now I've got a publications assistant as well as a publications manager who are managing all of those projects because it's a very detailed process. Once you start into publishing, it is very detailed and, um, and you have to, you know, be very careful because, you know, you don't want mistakes to, uh, to escape you. So there's a lot of checking and cross-checking and proofing and, you know, all of that so that the products are pristine. And, and in Ooze, a traditionally published book, not a self-published book, yeah. okay? So the difference is, like, when you see someone who's done it themselves, you can tell. You, like, so can tell. Like, the layout is, like, really not even, like, you know, um, and it just, things are just slapped together and it's been gone, taken to the local, you know, uh, printer or whatever it is. But what we want to do is, yeah, have a book that's going to feel and look internally like, like it's been done from a, a professional publisher and um, it's well lined up. It's got its barcode, your ISBNs proper copyright page you know and it's got the publisher so our logo ultimate world publishing here on the right um you know that's the thing that goes in the back of the books because we didn't want to put 48 hour author simply because we didn't want people to undermine the quality of the book thinking it's over 48 hours so yeah. we developed that the same uh, branding <laughs> as you can see but um the publishing side of things stay separate and we get hired just for publishing as well yeah that's brilliant because then you know most people will be put off writing a book because it's like where do i start yeah. where do, there's so many things that they don't know that they don't know as well you know they might know oh, where do i start writing the book but how do i get it published you know and and you're like the one-stop shop for them to come to and they can get everything done yeah well the the best place they meet people meet us is at our half day seminar which we run now once a fortnight and um that's where they really get a lot of those initial questions answered, you know, and understand the publishing industry and see how a book comes together from something like being done every now, like all the time to something quite unique. Yeah. And that's when they start to realize, shit, I do need a bit more help than I thought I needed maybe at the beginning because they understand that there's a lot more that has been thought through in this whole process. Um, you know, when you've done it with 500 people and I've done it 12 times myself, of course, I've got intricate tips and tricks and details that someone who's just starting will not know themselves. Yeah. So where, where to next, Nat? Like you guys have created such an amazing business. What's your plan for the next 12 to, to 18 months? What's your plan? I thought you were going to say 12 to 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like 12 to 18 months. That's easy. I've already got that line. Um, All right, well, go, tell me more. Tell me bigger. Let's go bigger. Well, certainly we're not moving back to an offline model. Uh, yeah. We're going to move that maybe once they, everything's really have settled down after COVID and things are opened up and we can go and do some, we'll do some really exclusive, like, you know, it'll become the premium ticket kind of thing. Hang out with me skin to skin, right? Yeah, and yeah. probably we'll take away those six people in our Queensland. We're going to call it the Denman, the, the house, pro the property. <laughs> we're going to play our surname. Um, so we could take, you know, do some stuff there that's quite exclusive, you know. Uh, but it will remain virtual. Our virtual retreats have actually been more productive for people. Yeah. Um, they get a lot more done. And they can take themselves away. It doesn't stop them from them going away for the 48 hours and actually taking the retreat in a beautiful place away from their everyday uh, distractions, yeah. right? And so we'll continue. We were thinking we're going to multiply the amount of retreats, but we won't now that we've planned the other day. And we're going to still run the same Feb, May, August, November um, dates that we normally would in a physical retreat year. Yeah. Uh, we have definitely um, doing two USA, Canada ones as well on top of regularly now. Uh, to cater for that side of the world because we're getting now that we have authors there that keep referring to us which means really we need to be able to say yes to the new people and um long term look i ha i would like to say uh someone said it to me and i kind of have had it in the back of my mind but i'd like to be like the hay house for um entrepreneurs you know hay house is mind body soul and they're a traditional publisher and you know, you, you know, Louise Hay has, you've yeah. been in this world of publishing for a long time, right? And she's passed on now, but um, she did it for a long time and she's globally known. 
And I'd like to think that, yeah, that sort of entrepreneurial, that, that person who helps um, uh, service-based business owners, the people who want to be speakers and all that, that's, that's what I'd like to be known as. And I'm already seeing aspects of that because a lot of people, you know, say, oh, I was referred to you whenever they kind of talk to me that they say how they've heard about me and I can, I can understand that the word has spread, but I bet you in 12 to 18 more years, it will have, you know, as long as I stay consistent and I'm still passionate about, which I can't see this. I think this is going to, this business will most likely be handed down to my children who will yeah. probably do it. Like, I think it doesn't expire. Writing books is not going to expire. Having a publishing company. So I think hopefully one of my kids will like it and want to yeah. do something with it. Yeah, that's brilliant. I'm just looking at myself at the start. We said, I said, can you see me with the light? And then I'm getting darker and darker. <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to see if I can put this light on. Here you go. There. I don't know how that light's going, but anyway, let's just pop that on so you can see me. What I did for my screen is I actually put the screen brightness um, up you know, on the Mac, how you can do the screen brighter and it made me look, I was going darker as well. <laughs> it was going darker and darker. Maybe that's a good thing. Anyway. <laughs> All righty. So how do people get in contact with you, Nat? How do they follow your work? What's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Look, my Facebook profile is public. So you just got to make sure you don't spell Natasha with a H though. Yeah. It's an A-T-A-S-A -A and it's Denman. Um, so you can definitely follow my profile there, but my, our website's really easy to remember. It's writerbook.com.au. I love that. My husband found it and he couldn't believe that it wasn't taken. Well, when I saw that, because it was only when, cause I keep thinking 48 hour author, but you when there was something as well, yeah. yeah. So, so there was something else that popped up. I think when I did your, spoke yeah. at your event last week that it came yeah. up, I thought, Wow, what a great <laughs> main name that you've got there. I couldn't believe it was. Yeah. We yeah. just started it three years ago uh, when we were sitting in a retreat and our IT guy was next to, uh, next to Stuart because he was crewing. He's actually one of my authors, James. Yeah. And, and Stuart was like, looking, we were talking about domain names and Stuart looked it up and he said, James, this is, this domain's buy it, buy it right now. <laughs> so he bought it. And so they're both pointed. So put it, our author goes to the same places. But the main one is writerbook.com.au. And I was like, everything's on there. Like our seminar pages, our authors. Our, there's so much on there to just look through and even just gain value from itself, you know. So that's where you go and you'll, you'll find us. Yeah, love it. All righty. Are you ready for JJ's rapid fire questions to finish go. off? All right, go. <laughs> You're ready as anything. All right, these are some fun questions. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice that you've been given? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this too shall pass. Yeah, this too shall pass. I love it. What's your favourite book that you've read? There are two times in life, now and too late by Terry Hawkins. Oh, I haven't read that one. Okay, I'm going to have to. The book that also made me go on this journey, but anyway, yeah. Uh, okay. Who would play you in a movie? Uh, what's her face? The um, uh, Coco Chanel woman. <laughs> like, um, I think, oh, no, it's not Audrey Hepburn, but I'm, I watched this um, movie, uh, or I think it was, no, someone was playing Coco Chanel, but I don't know the actress. Uh, but I'm an absolutely obsessed person with Chanel. Like, my <laughs> new house in Queensland is going to be Chanel inspired. Yeah. <laughs> love it what's the what's one thing and i know you've traveled a lot but what's one thing on your bucket list mm, i want to ski japan and canada snow skiing beautiful if you could trade lives with anyone for one day who would it be and why reese with the spoon <laughs> <laughs> because i love legally blonde and um I don't know. I think she would have a fun life. <laughs> <laughs> Three words that describe you. Fun, fast and fame. Fun, fast and fame. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. If you could have any five people that are currently dead or alive to have for dinner, yes. who would you choose? Oh, five people. Okay. Then Tony Robbins. Yeah. Because I'm curious. Um, I'm not, I actually don't have a desire to go to his events, but I think as a person, he would be cool to have dinner with. I've never done any of his events, 
actually I've just read books and I know Francesca's completely obsessed with him, one of my people that I collaborate with, but I've never done it, but I, I think it'd be interesting. Terry Hawkins, who uh, wrote that book, There Are Two Times in Life, Nine Too Late. I've hung out with her, but like, I'd love to have her for dinner and see where she's at now. Um, uh, Dead or Alive, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, Brian Tracy, yeah. yeah. Uh, is he still alive? Uh, maybe um, not. I don't know, actually. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. So Brian, I don't think he is. Uh, Brian Tracy, oh, then for Woo Winners, um, Esther Hicks, who channels Abraham. Yes, so for the Woo Woo Factor. And then I think Donald Trump, because he'd be, <laughs> he'd be like just a... <laughs> funny person but an amazing I, I guess a business owner who I don't know just yeah. just he comes up with some really inappropriate things that he says and I just think that would be amusing <laughs> if you could have one superpower what would it be uh superpower oh, I think superman it has to be like fast to be fast like flash actually flash flash <laughs> I think it'd be flash already <laughs> Exactly. So I just like like to do it even faster, you know. So that can get that more done. Yes. <laughs> that says a lot about you. What TV sitcom family would you be a part of? Um, that I identify my family with, or okay, with you. yeah. Uh, da -da -da -da. Oh, I'm trying to um, think of shows. Oh, God. Who's a family that has three kids? Or if you just want to be in that family. Ah. You know, I used to be obsessed with Beverly Hills 90210. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with Brandon and um, that twin, whoever, Shannon, Dorothy, and I'll be the, like the, the third kid, the younger. <laughs> <laughs> what legacy do you want? This is the last question. What legacy do you want to be remembered for? Well, yes, that I was like the hay house of um, publishers and uh, someone who helped thousands upon thousands of people become first-time authors. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Natasha, for your time today. I just love talking to you. And um, even when I was a part of your event last week, the tribe that you've created and the energy that you've got, uh, but even more than that, you really come from a heart space. You know, yeah. you've created such a, an amazing business but it's all through service. It's all about serving others and, and helping people tell their stories. And you really, and this is why we connected because we both have such a passion to help people, genuinely help people. Uh, and that really shines through with everything you do. And I hear that, you know, for, from so many of your authors that have worked with you, how you've really supported them and they feel like family to you, you know, yeah. and, and you feel like family to them. So it's a really... That, that my fourth word is um, those are fun, fast, fame is who, what describes me, but those are and families are our values. So a family goes in the middle of those. Yeah. And so yeah. if I had that and fourth word, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, you're definitely living your values. So thank you mu so much. And for yeah. those listening, make sure that you get on to, and it was write your, write a book.com.au. Write a book.com.au and uh, check Nat, Nat out and follow Natasha on Instagram and Facebook uh, and LinkedIn. Just get on every platform so you can get as much of her information as possible because it's so valuable. Thank you so much, Nat. Pleasure. See you, JJ. My pleasure. See you later. Bye.